Hello, good day and welcome. I will be answering Jam 22 of Chemistry Pass Question 2. Which of the following methods can be used to obtain pure water from a mixture of sand, water, and methanoic acid? Now, having the mixture of sand, water, and methanoic acid, definitely you know that water and methanoic acid are two immiscible liquids, and then sand is also insoluble in these two solvents. So, since you have an insoluble solute, which is the sand, plus water, and the methanoic acid in order to eliminate this methanoic acid you simply react a methanoic acid with a base and the suitable base is sodium hydroxide now reaction of methanoic acid and sodium hydroxide naoh is known as neutralization now when you do this this methanoic acid will be eliminated thereby forming salt and more water because like we know acid plus base will give us salt and water which is a neutralization reaction so it will give us salt and water now the salt formed will be soluble in water will be, ins will be insoluble in water sorry salt form will be insoluble in water now when the salt is formed it can then be what be filtered out so that what we can have out our fluid which is the water liberating the salt so now this sun here will be the filtrate while the water will be liberated out so the answer to this question actually is option a neutralization with naoh followed by filtration thank you and ensure subscribe to the channel for more videos and past questions Hello, good day and welcome. I'll be answering Jam 22 of Math Chemistry Pass Question 3. How many atoms are present in 6 grams of magnesium? A. 1.2 times 10 is power of 22. B. 2.41 times 10 is power of 22. C. 1.51 times 10 is power of 23. And D. 3.02 times 10 is power of 23. Now, the atomic mass of magnesium, atomic mass of magnesium is equal to 24 grams that's the molar mass now we are asked to find the number of atoms present in 6 grams of magnesium now according to Avogadro's law or Avogadro's hypothesis one mole of a substance which is 20, which is 24 grams of magnesium will contain 6.02 times 10 raised power of 23 atoms now for 6 grams of magnesium it will contain x number of atoms so therefore x will be equals to x will be equals to 6.02 times 10 raised power of 23 multiplied by 6 all over 24 now this is equals to 6.02 times 10 raised power of 23 multiplied by 0 0.25 and that is equals to 1.51 times 10 raised power of 23 therefore 6 grams of magnesium will contain 1.51 times 10 is power of 23 atoms of magnesium and that is option C. Thank you and ensure to subscribe to the channel for more videos and past questions. Hello, good day and welcome. I will be answering Jump to the of Mathematics past question 4. 50 centimeter cube of the gas was collected over water as 10 degrees Celsius and 765 millimeters mercury. Calculate the volume of the gas at STP as standard temperature and pressure in saturated vapor pressure of water at 10 degrees Celsius is 5 millimeters mercury. Now it simply means that V1 is equal to 50 centimeter cube. Now C1 is equal to 10 degrees Celsius. Now converting this now to Kelvin, it will give us 10 plus 273 Kelvin and that will give us 283 Kelvin then P1 is equal to now look at the statement it says if the saturated vapor pressure of water at 10 degrees Celsius is 5 it simply means that P1 will be equal to what? 765 millimeter mercury minus 5 and that is equal to 760 millimeter mercury now V2 is what we are looking for P2 at STP standard pressure is 760 millimeter mercury and then standard temperature T2 
is equal to 273 Kelvin. So with this now, applying the general gas equation, which is P1 V1 over T1 is equal to P2 V2 over T2. So from here we have that P1, which is 760 multiplied by E1, 50 all over T1, 2 is 3 is equal to P2, which is 760 multiplied by V2 all over T2, which is 273. From here we have that V2 is equal to 760 multiplied by 50 multiplied by 273 all over 760 multiplied by 283. Now, doing this will give us that V2 will be equal to 48.23 centimeter cube. And that is option D, 48.23 centimeter cube. Thank you and you should subscribe to the channel for more videos and questions. Hello, good day and welcome. I will be answering Jump 2012 Math Chemistry Past Question 5. An increase in the pressure exerted on a gas at constant temperature results in A. A decrease in number of effective collisions B. A decrease in volume C. An increase in average intermolecular distance and D. An increase in volume. Now, an increase in pressure exerted on a gas at a constant temperature is just trying to describe Boyce's law. Because Boyce's law is the law that describes the relationship between pressure and volume at constant temperature, where he said that the volume of a given mass of gas, V, is the inversely proportional to its pressure, provided that the temperature remains constant. Now, that is the statement of Boyce, whereby we now have that V1 P1 is equal to V2. P2. It simply means that the volume is inversely proportional to the pressure. So therefore, an increase in pressure now, like I said, will lead towards a decrease in volume. When there's an increase in pressure, it results in a decrease in volume. And when there's a decrease in pressure, that will result in what? An increase in volume because they are inversely related according to boys. So the answer to this question is actually a decrease in volume. Thank you and ensure subscribe to the channel for more videos and fast questions. Hello, good day and welcome. I will be answering Jam 2012 Chemistry Pass Question 6. In the reaction above, the what volume of hydrogen will be left over when 300 cm cube of oxygen and 1000 cm cube of hydrogen are exploded in a sealed tube. Now this question here is under Gay-Lussac's law of combining volumes. Because Gay-Lussac's law of combining volumes says that when gases react, they do so in ratios which have simple, we do so in volumes which have simple ratios to one another and to the products if gaseous, provided that the temperature and pressure remains constant. Now looking at these two reactants here and the products, you notice that they are all in gaseous form. So therefore, Gay-Lussac's law applies to these gases. Now looking at these gases, they actually react in simple ratios. Looking at it now, two moles of hydrogen is required, requires one mole of oxygen to give two moles of water in gaseous form, which is steam. Now, 300 centimeter cube of oxygen reacted with 1,000 centimeter cube. Now, this is what the volume of the reactant. Let's call this volume of reactant. Volume of reactant. Now, let's look at the combining volumes now. Combining volumes because the combining volumes also will be in the same simple ratio as the mole of these gases. Since two moles of hydrogen requires one mole of oxygen to react, therefore, and one mole of oxygen is 300 centimeter cube. So the combining volume of oxygen is 300 centimeter cube. Then the combining volume of hydrogen also will be two multiplied by 300, and that will be equal to 600 centimeter cube. That's the combining volume of hydrogen. So that means 600 centimeter cube combined with 300 centimeter cube of oxygen to give us also 600 centimeter cube of 
steam now the volume of the reactant which is volume of hydrogen is 1000 centimeter cube but the combining volume now is 600 centimeter cube now to find the what the remaining volume the remaining volume remaining volume will be equals to 1000 which is the volume of hydrogen minus the reacting or the combining volume which is 600 and that is equals to 400 centimeter cube so 400 centimeter cube is the volume of hydrogen remaining which is what the volume that is left over after the reaction so the answer to the question is option b thank you and you should subscribe to the channel for more videos and past questions Hello, good day and welcome. I will be answering Jam 2012 Chemistry Pass Question 7. Which of the above can correctly be listed as evidence for the particulate nature of matter? We have evaporation, sublimation, diffusion, and Brownian motion. Now, looking at this, you notice that evaporation simply means what change of states from liquid, from liquid to vapor, but actually without getting to its boiling point. Sublimation simply refers to change of states from solid directly to gas. Then diffusion here is just what showing the movement of molecules. Movement of molecules from higher concentration to lower concentration. Why Brennan motion is just the haphazard motion. Haphazard motion of the particles of a material due to the bombardment of this material by the surrounding environment. Now if you look at these four phenomena which is evaporation, sublimation, diffusion and barrier motion, you will notice that they all talk about the particulate nature of matter because they deal with the particle of matter. Evaporation dealing with the particle changing what from liquid to vapor. Sublimation dealing with the particle changing from solid to gas and diffusion dealing with the movement of the particles. Brownian motion also dealing with the haphazard motion of the particles of this world, of this material which is matter. So therefore, everything listed here actually was serve as an evidence for the particulate nature of matter, making option D the correct answer to this question. Thank you and ensure you subscribe to our channel for more videos and past questions. Hello, good day and welcome. I will be answering Jam 2012 Chemistry Pass Question 8. If the elements X and Y have atomic number 11 and 17 respectively, what type of bond can they form? A. Dative, B. Covalent, C. Ionic, and D. Metallic. Now we have two elements, X and Y. Element X has atomic number of 11 and Y has atomic number of 17. Now arranging this properly using the shells, we have 2 comma 8 comma 1 and for the y we have 2 comma 8 comma 7 it simply means that x has a valence electron of 1 that's the valence signal the valence electron that's electron on the outermost shell is 1 and y has a valence electron of 7 now looking at this x requires to give out one electron to complete its optic structure and y requires one electron to complete its electric structure that means element x we donate one and element y we would accept one electron to complete its optic structure now this type of bonding which involves the transfer of electron is known as electrovalence electrovalent or ionic bond is a type of bond that involves the transfer of electron from one atom, usually a metal, to another atom, usually a non-metal. Now looking at element X from the periodic table, element X represents sodium, while element Y represents chlorine. And this is a metal and this is a non-metal. So the answer to this question is option C, ionic bond. Thank you and ensure subscribe to the channel for more videos and past questions.
Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering Jam 22 of Chemistry Pass Question 9. A hydrogen atom which has lost an electron contains a 1 proton only, b 1 neutron only, c 1 proton and 1 neutron, d 1 proton, 1 electron and neutron. A hydrogen atom, hydrogen which is the first element on the periodic table, has atomic number of 2 of one sorry atomic number one and atomic mass one now atomic number simply represent the number of protons atomic number represent the number of protons of an element and atomic mass represent the sum of number of protons and neutron now if the atomic number is one it simply means that the number of protons of hydrogen is equals to one and since atomic mass is then equal to one it simply means that the atomic mass also represents what the number of protons of hydrogen so it simply means that the number of neutron in hydrogen atom is equal to zero now number of proton is also equivalent to the number of electrons so the number of electron of hydrogen atom is also equal to one now if an hydrogen atom lost one electron it simply means that the only content of that atom currently is just one proton because an hydrogen atom has no neutron so the answer to this question is option a one proton only present in the nucleus of the atom thank you and ensure subscribe to this channel for more videos and past questions Hello, good day and welcome. I will be answering Jump 22 of Chemistry Pass Question 10. The electronic configuration of magnesium ion is. Now, this is a magnesium ion, now not an atom. Magnesium atom is Mg. And magnesium has. Magnesium number um, atom is Mg. Magnesium has an atomic number of 12. It has an atomic number of 12 so therefore it simply means that this magnesium ion which is mg2 plus that is it has lost two electrons will now have what 10 electrons because the number of proton which is atomic number is equivalent to the number of electrons so an atom will have 12 electrons but magnesium ion which has lost two electrons will definitely have what 10 electrons left so now writing this electronic configuration for these 10 electrons will be 1s2 2s2 and 2p6 so the answer to this question is actually option c thank you and ensure subscribe to the channel for more videos and past questions Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering Jam 22 of Chemistry Pass Question 11. Group 7 elements are monoatomic, B, good oxidizing agent, C, highly electropositive, and D, electron donors. Now, group 7 elements are also known as the halogens. They are called the halogens. They are called halogens because we refer to them as salt former. Now basically, this group 7 element do not occur in free state. They usually occur as salts that is attached to other elements to form salts. So the only way you find them in nature is in combined states. And that shows that this, uh, this group 7 elements are actually both very reactive. They are very reactive. Now group 7 elements known as halogens are diatomic. They are diatomic molecules. Or the atomic atoms in the sense that they do not exist as one atom like for instance the carbon that exists as one atom the oxygen that exists as one atom no the group seven elements exist as diatomic atoms example is the chlorine the fluorine they exist as what as diatomic now so therefore option a is wrong 
option b here says good oxidizing agent now an oxidizing agent is simply an agent that's what that causes oxidation oxidation of other elements now looking at group seven elements group seven elements are under group seven because they have seven electrons in their outermost shell now it simply means that they require one electron to complete the octet structure so it is easier for this group seven elements to accept an electron than to donate so because they accept electrons we call them what good oxidizing agents since oxidation simply refers to the loss of electron now if they accept an electron from another element or another atom they therefore cause the oxidation of the other atom so we refer to them as what good oxidizing agents making option b correct option c says highly electropositive no group 7 elements are highly electronegative they are very very electronegative with the most electronegative atom or element to be fluorine so it's wrong and this is electron donors like i said they are electron acceptors because they have seven electrons in the outermost shell and require one electron to complete their other structure so instead of donating they actually accept and by accepting electron it makes them what a good oxidizing agent therefore making option b the correct answer to this question thank you and ensure subscribe to the channel for more videos and past questions hello good day and welcome i'll be answering jump 2012 chemistry pass question 12. which of the following is used to study the arrangement of particles in crystal lattices a alpha particles b beta particles c gamma rays and d x-rays now all these are actually radioactive or emissions now looking at the alpha particle alpha particle is actually a radioactive emission but now alpha particle has what's the lowest penetration it has the lowest penetration power and can actually what only penetrate what piece of paper it can be blocked or a piece of paper so therefore alpha particle cannot be used to study the arrangement of particles in crystal lattices beta particles also it has higher penetrating power than alpha particle but can actually be what be limited by aluminium foil aluminium foil it's Penetrating power is higher than alpha particle, but still cannot be used to study the arrangement of particles in crystal lattices. Now, gamma rays. Gamma rays is not a particle, but what an electromagnetic radiation or emission. Now, gamma rays actually has the what the highest penetrating power, but then it can only be used what, to study the arrangement of ion metals like iron and lead. Now, X-ray on the other hand, which is also an electromagnetic what radiation has the what the ability or the capacity to penetrate any material and it can be used to what to study the arrangement of particles in crystal lattices in chemistry in chemistry x-rays is actually used to what to study the arrangement of particles in crystals now this x-ray is actually divided into two we have the soft x-ray the soft x-ray which is used in medicine and then we have the hard x-ray which is used in chemistry now this hard x-ray is what is used to study the arrangement of particles in crystal lattices but the soft x-ray is actually used in medicine to what to make diagnosis like fracture so the answer to this question is actually option d x-ray thank you and ensure subscribe to the channel for more videos and past questions hello good day and welcome i'll be answering jam 2012 chemistry pass question 13. now this given description above is actually talking about the properties of air now we are asked that which of the above shows that air is a mixture now i says it has a varied composition from one place to another like we know the composition of air here and composition of air in another place actually varies now I I says the its constituents can be separated by physical means. Like we know also, air is a mixture and can be separated by physical means. Now I I I says it contains unreactive noble gases. Now let's look at it. Which of the above shows that air is a mixture? Now a mixture simply refers to what? Simply refers to substance. It refers to substance that 
can be separated as can be separated by physical means now looking at a mixture a mixture cannot be represented by a chemical formula it simply means that a mixture actually what comprises of various substances and these various substances are in different words composition and that is why it's that a mixture the composition of a mixture actually what varies from place to place now also a mixture do not contains what reactive substances because if a mixture contains of reactive substances when they react together it's no longer a mixture it becomes what a compound because a compound consists of substances that actually what react chemically with each other so looking at this you see that what from the statement already i say mixture are substances that can be separated by physical means it simply means that ii is correct because its constituents can be separated by physical means option iii says it contains unreactive noble gases is also correct mixtures consist of substances that do not react chemically with each other and like you know air consists of unreactive noble gases making it what a mixture i now says it has a varied composition from one place to another i also makes it what a mixture so the answer to this question is actually option d iii and iii only thank you and ensure subscribe to the channel for more videos and past questions Good day and welcome. I'll be answering Jump 2012 Mathematics Pass Question 14. The chemical used to soften hard water involves the addition of A. Insoluble sodium compound which forms soluble solution of calcium and magnesium. B. Soluble sodium compounds which form soluble solutions of calcium and magnesium ions. C. Soluble sodium compounds which form insoluble precipitates of calcium and magnesium ions. D. Insoluble precipitates of calcium and magnesium ions. Now looking at this. When we have a hard water, hard water now is divided into two. We have the temporary hard water and the permanent hard water. But the hard water that is being looking into play that we're looking at here now is the permanent hard water because temporary hard water can actually be removed by boiling. But since we are actually looking at the permanent hard water, now permanent hard water actually consists of the ions of soluble ions of calcium like calcium sulfates and also soluble ions of magnesium like magnesium sulfate now in order to remove what this hard water we have to put in chemicals we have to put in chemicals that enable us what remove this turn this soluble compounds into insoluble compounds now the chemical that can be used is actually what soluble sodium compound like the sodium triazo carbonate for Na2CO3. Now, when you put this soluble compound in a hard water containing calcium sulfate, which is soluble, it will give us an insoluble calcium triazo carbonate for plus sodium sulfate. Now, this calcium triazo carbonate for here is insoluble in the water, thereby precipitating this what this ion. So, the removal of the hard water or the softening of hard water involves the use of soluble sodium compound like sodium triazocarbonate 4, which forms insoluble precipitates of calcium and magnesium ion. So, the answer to this question is actually option C. Thank you, and ensure subscribe to the channel for more videos and past questions. Hello, good day, and welcome. I'll be answering Jump 2012 Chemistry Pass Question 15. Chlorination of water for town supply is carried out to A. Make the water colorless, B. Remove germs from the water, C. Make the water taste, make the water tasteful, and D. Remove odor from the water. Now, the purpose of chlorination, which simply refers to what? Adding of chlorine. Chlorination refers to the adding of chlorine during water treatment for town supply. Its main purpose is just actually to kill the germs present in the water. Is to kill the germs present in the water. So therefore, the answer to this question is actually what option B: remove germs from the water. Thank you, and ensure subscribe to the channel for more videos and past questions.
Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering Jump 2012 Chemistry Pass Question 16. The solubilities of different solutes in a given solvent can be compared by. Now, when you have the solubility of different solutes in a solvent, like putting maybe take for instance now you have a solvent like water, and in this water you put in the common salt, which is sodium chloride, put in the um, sodium trisulfonate salt, put in the sodium tetrasulfate salt. Or you put in a sugar solution and you're trying to compare the solubility of this salt in water now the thing is that when you have a graph like this this is the y-axis and this is the x-axis you must ensure that you plot the solubility curves of each of these salts on this same axis because you're trying to compare their solubility so now you plotting their solubility on this same axis that's involving both the y-axis and the x-axis will enable you would to be able to compare and contrast their solubilities in water so the answer to this option is actually what plotting their solubility curves on the same axis this same axis involves what both the x and y axis thank you and ensure subscribe to the channel for more videos and past questions Good day and welcome. I'll be answering Jump 2012 Chemistry Pass Question 18. Which of the following pollutants is associated with brain damage? Now, pollutant simply refers to those harmful substances that causes pollution. Harmful substances that causes pollution, that is, substances that causes pollution are referred to as pollutants. Now, the question is asking us for the pollutant that results in brain damage. Now, let's analyze the pollutants given. Now, carbon 2 oxide, also known as carbon monoxide, is an air pollutant. Now, this carbon 2 oxide, if inhaled into the system, goes and reacts with the hemoglobin content of the red blood cell. So, carbon 2 oxide, which is CO, plus the, the hemoglobin, hemoglobin, will now form what you call the carboxy hemoglobin. It will form what you call carboxy hemoglobin. Now, this carboxy hemoglobin carboxy hemoglobin prevents the transport of oxygen and like you know the brain requires what a lot of oxygen to function a lot of o2 to function now because this carbon monoxide goes and combine with this hemoglobin it will prevent the transport of oxygen to the brain and due to the loss of oxygen transport to the brain the brain begins to suffer shock and then it results in what brain damage. So, so therefore, carbon two oxide causes brain damage. Now, the reactive fallout simply refers to all these reactive emissions that are actually harmful to the world, to the body, but they do not cause brain damage. Biodegradable waste are waste that actually will be broken down, like the waste food, the sewages, and the rest. Now, sulfur four oxide, on the other hand, is also an air pollutant. Now, sulfur four oxide do not cause brain damage, but it's, it is an irritant of the eye. It's an irritant. Of the eye it irritates the eye and can also cause acid rain so the answer to this question is option a carbon dioxide that leads to brain damage due to suffocation and shock thank you and you should subscribe to the channel for more videos and past questions Hello, good day, and welcome. I'll be answering Jump 2012 Chemistry Pass Question 19. Which of the following would produce a solution with pH less than 7 at equivalent point? Now, looking at these given reactions, we are actually given a reaction that is a neutralization reaction because a reaction involving an acid and a base or an alkali to give salt and water is known as neutralization reaction. Neutralization reaction. Now, looking at this, the question is asking us for the reaction that will actually produce a solution with pH less than 7. It simply means that this resulting solution or the resulting salt will be what will be acidic. Now for you to have a salt that will be acidic from any of this reaction, it simply will involve a reaction involving a very strong acid and a weak base. Because if you are reacting a strong acid and a strong base, you definitely get towards a neutral salt. Then a strong acid and a weak base will give us a what? An acid salt. A weak acid and a weak and a strong base will give us a what? A basic salt. And then a weak acid 
and a weak base will give us a normal sort. Now looking at this, HNO3 is a strong acid, h 24 is a strong acid and HCl a strong acid. But sodium hydroxide here is a strong base and potassium hydroxide is a strong base but magnesium hydroxide is a weak is a weak base so it simply means that since hydrochloric acid which is hcl which is a strong acid hcl a strong acid once it reacts now with magnesium hydroxide which is a weak base it will definitely give us what magnesium chloride which is a what an acidic salt so therefore now the resulting solution now of this reaction which is this magnesium chloride is what will be less than seven because an acidic salt so the answer to this question actually is option c hcl hydrochloric acid plus magnesium hydroxide because this is a strong acid and this is a weak base but option a here we have a strong acid and a strong base that will give us a normal salt b strong acid and a strong base also a normal salt and c strong acid and a strong base a normal salt but c strong acid and a weak base and that will give us an acidic salt so option c is the correct answer to this question thank you and ensure subscribe to the channel for more videos and past questions Good day and welcome. I'll be answering Jam 2012 Chemistry Pass Question 20. The number of hydrozonium ion produced by one molecule of an acid in aqueous solution is its A basicity, B acid strength, C pH, and D concentration. Now, looking at basicity of an acid, basicity of an acid simply refers to the number of hydrogen ion produced by one molecule of an acid the number of hydrogen ion produced now an acid we always produce an hydrogen ion as its only positive ion but when this acid is placed in an aqueous solution it will produce hydrozonium ion so it simply means that the number of hydrogen ion produced by one molecule of an acid is equals to is also equivalent to the number of hydrozonium ion produced by that same acid in an aqueous solution and that refers to the basicity of that acid making option a correct now acid strength here simply refers to the tendency the tendency of an acid to dissociate into protons which is the hydrogen ion and anions the tendency of an acid to divide into to dissociate into protons and anions white pH on the other hand represents the measure or the degree of acidity or alkalinity of a substance alkalinity that is trying to measure how acidic or how alkaline a substance may be then concentration here simply refers to the amount the amount of a substance the amount of a substance present in a given volume in a given volume of that substance so the answer to this question actually is option a basicity that describes the number of hydrogen ion produced by one molecule of an acid and i say it's also equivalent to the number of hydrozonium ion produced by that same acid in an aqueous solution Thank you and ensure to subscribe to the channel for more videos and past questions. Hello, good day and welcome. I will be answering Jump 2012 Chemistry Pass Question 21. During a titration experiment, 0.05 mole of carbon 4 oxide is liberated. What is the volume of gas liberated? Now we have what we call the molar volume of gas. Molar volume of gas at STP. Molar volume of gas at STP is equal to 22.40 dm cube. Now this is the molar volume of a gas at standard temperature and pressure. Now it is noted that one mole of every gas, and this gas given to us into consideration is carbon dioxide so one mole of carbon dioxide will always contain 
dm cube that is the volume will always be 22.4 dm cube at standard temperature and pressure now if it is now 0.05 moles so 0.05 moles will give us what how many volumes now that will be equals to 0 0.5 0.5 multiply by 22.4 since one mole represents 22.4 so 0 0.05 will represent 0 0.05 multiplied by 22.4 and that is equals to 1.12 dm cube so the answer to this question is option d Thank you and ensure to subscribe to the channel for more videos and past questions. Hello, good day and welcome. I'll be answering jump 22 of chemistry past question 22. A major factor considered in selecting a suitable method for preparing a simple salt is it a crystalline form, b melting point, c rack activity with dilute acid and D solubility in water. Now a salt simply refers to a compound formed. A salt refers, refers to compound that are formed when the replaceable hydrogen ion when the replaceable hydrogen ion are either completely either completely or partially replaced by a metal. Now we can see salt is formed when a metal replaces the hydrogen ion of an acid. Now there are various types of salts ranging from the acid salt, the base salt, the double salt, complex salt and all these salts are actually prepared in the laboratory method for preparing the salts actually depends on two factors number one factor is the solubility in water solubility in water and number two factor that is considered for salt preparation is its stability to heat stability to heat but now this question is asking us for the method that is for the factor that is required as a suitable method for preparing a simple salt. Now, for you to prepare a simple salt, the major factor that is actually considered is its solubility in water. That is, how soluble the salt will be in water, whether it will be soluble in water or insoluble in water. And looking at it, that is option D. So, solubility in water is the major factor considered in selecting a suitable method for preparing salt, which is option D. Thank you and ensure to subscribe to the channel for more videos and past questions. Good day and welcome. I will be answering jump 22 of chemistry past question 23. The oxidation number of boron in this given compound containing sodium, boron and hydrogen is so we are asked to find the oxidation number of boron in this given compound. Now, option A says minus 3, B minus 1, C plus 1, and D plus 3. Now, looking at this compound here, sodium and boron here act as cations. Why this hydrogen here acts as an anion? Now, looking at this, the oxidation number of sodium is plus 1. Oxidation number of sodium is plus 1. And in this compound, the oxidation number of hydrogen is assumed to be minus 1. So, we equate this to 0. So, we have oxidation number of sodium, which is plus 1, plus boron, which is what we are looking for, plus that of hydrogen, which is minus 1, times 4 is equal to 0. So, we have plus 1 plus b minus 4 is equal to 0. Now from here we'll have that plus 1 minus 4 will give us minus 3. So b plus minus 3 is equal to 0. Now taking this minus 3 to the other side we'll have b is equal to plus 3. So the oxidation number of boron in this compound is actually plus 3 which is option D. Thank you and ensure to subscribe to our channel for more videos and past questions.
Hello, good day, and welcome. I'll be answering Jam 2012 Chemistry Pass Question 24. Given this equation, we have the question involving the oxide of sodium and water to give us sodium hydroxide and oxygen. Now, the substance that is oxidized in this reaction above is we are asked to find the substance which is oxidized in the reaction above. Now, looking at this, we know that oxidation can be divided in various forms. Now, oxidation can simply refers to addition of oxygen, addition of oxygen is one definition of oxidation or removal of hydrogen. Removal of hydrogen is also what a form of oxidation or loss of electron. Now, these three forms are what are the definition of oxidation is either the addition of oxygen or removal of hydrogen or loss of electron. Now, looking at this equation, you observe that the substance that is oxidized here is actually water because water, four atoms of hydrogen, is actually removed from this water, from this water to have your words to liberate oxygen. And this hydrogen atom is now being added to what added to this um, sodium oxide here. So you can see that this sodium oxide acts as the oxidizing agent. It oxidized water thereby leaving out what oxygen so the substance that is oxidized is water but the oxidizing agent is this sodium oxide here because hydrogen is being removed from water and removal of hydrogen is oxidation and what's the substance that's allowed the removal of hydrogen is this sodium oxide here so this sodium oxide acts as a reduced and an oxidizing agent but the substance which is oxidized according to the question is what water h2o and that is option c thank you and ensure you subscribe to the channel for more videos and past questions Hello, good day and welcome. I'll be answering Jam 2012 Chemistry Pass Question 26. A metal M displaces zinc from zinc chloride solution. This shows that A. The electrons flow from zinc to M. B. M is more electropositive than zinc. C. M is more electronegative than zinc. And D. Zinc is more electropositive than M. Now, if a metal M should react with zinc chloride, and displaces zinc from this solution thereby giving rise to this equation plus zinc it simply means that this metal is higher than zinc in the electrochemical series electrochemical series electrochemical series it sh simply shows the position of each metal that is how reactive each metal is the strength of each metal is actually described by this electrochemical series so if a metal should displace zinc from its own solution like zinc chloride here it simply represents that this metal is actually higher than zinc in the electrochemical series and it also implies that the metal is more electropositive it is more electropositive than zinc because the higher its position on the electrochemical series, the higher its electropositivity and the higher its reaction. And that is why it is able to displace zinc from this solution. But if the metal is actually lower than zinc in the electrochemical series, there is no way it will be able to displace zinc because zinc will be more reactive than the metal. But because the metal is more reactive than zinc and occupies a higher position on this electrochemical series, it makes it more electropositive than zinc. And that is why it is able to displace zinc from the solution of sodium zinc chloride. So the answer to the question is option B. M is more electropositive than zinc. Thank you and ensure to subscribe to the channel for more videos and past questions. Good day and welcome. I will be answering Jump 2012 Chemistry Pass Question 27. Given the reaction above, we have the reaction of carbon monoxide and water to give us carbon dioxide and oxygen and hydrogen. Now we are asked to calculate the heat standard heat change of reaction above if the standard enthalpies of the formation of 
carbon dioxide, water, and carbon monoxide in kilojoules per mole are minus 394, minus 242, and minus 110, respectively. Now, to find the standard heat change, which is delta H, it is equal to standard heat change delta H is equal to the heat change or the heat content of the P of the product minus that of the reactants. So that is heat of product minus heat of reactants. Now looking at the product, the products here are carbon dioxide and hydrogen. But the heat content of hydrogen now will be zero because it's an element because it doesn't have heat of formation. But that of carbon dioxide is given. The heat of formation of carbon dioxide is equals to minus 394. So we simply have that delta H is equals to minus 394 minus now the heat content of the reactants will be that of carbon monoxide plus that of water and the heat content of mon carbon uh, monoxide is minus 242 so plus that of water which is minus 110 so this is equals to minus 394 minus minus three five two so this will give us minus three nine four plus minus three five plus three five two sorry plus three five two because minus times minus will give us plus and minus three nine four plus three five two will give us minus forty two kilojoules per mole so the answer to this question is actually option d minus forty two kilojoules per mole that is the standard heat change of the reaction above Thank you and ensure subscribe to the channel for more videos and pass. Good day and welcome. I'll be answering Jump 2012 Chemistry Pass Question 28. An increase in entropy can best be illustrated by A. Mixing of gases, B. Freezing of water, C. Condensation of vapor, and D. Solidifying candle wax. Now, when we say entropy, entropy simply refers to degree of disorderliness, the degree of disorderliness or randomness. So, when you are talking about increase in entropy, simply means what? Increase in disorderliness or increase in randomness. Now, I'm looking at this here. Let's analyze the options. Freezing of water, we only would decrease disorderliness because the particles of water will become what will become in a fixed position because they're trying to what, make water to become ice condensation of vapor also is decreasing entropy because like we know gases are more mobile than liquids also solidifying candle wax which is in liquid form is also a form of what decreasing entropy because like we know solid are more mobile than what than um, liquid are more mobile than solids in terms of their molecules but looking at this option a mixing of gases when gases are mixed together in a decaying container, what's happened? These gases begin to, the molecules of the gases begin to bombard each other, thereby increasing randomness and disorderliness because they begin to bombard with each other and also with the wall of the container, so thereby increasing what entropy. So mixing of gases increases entropy, but the rest here is actually decreasing entropy. So the answer to our question is option A. Thank you and ensure subscribe to the channel for more videos and past questions.